Hey health junkies, Dr. Krause here. Just wanted to jump in and let you know about a new feature that I'm adding to the podcast. It's the ability to ask me questions. I've had a ton of folks tell me that they would love for me to cover their questions on the podcast, so I'm going to do it. So each week I will be adding a couple of questions that I'm going to answer to each of the podcasts. And if it's a juicy enough question, I just may dedicate a whole podcast to it. So if you're interested in asking a question, head on over to my website at drjkrausnd.com. Check out a blue button on the right-hand side that says Ask a Podcast Question. Hit me up there. Or you can also access the button through my podcast notes also on my website. So head on over there, ask me some questions. I look forward to answering them soon. All right, let's get on with the podcast. Hey, health junkies. It's time for The Health Fix. Join your host, Dr. Janine Kraus, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Today's episode is all about fascia. Fascia is the wrapping that is around your muscles. It's underneath your skin. It wraps around your tendons. It wraps around your organs. It basically allows us to keep organs and muscles and tendons in place, but also allows them to slide over each other. It helps with contributing with the strength of our overall muscles. It helps with keeping us in alignment. And it's one of the most overlooked components in terms of formation of strength. It's one of the overlooked components in pain control and pain management. And it's also overlooked in terms of a sensory organ. In fact, it might be one of our greatest sensory organs. And so today I'm going to talk all about that and how you can work at home on your fascia. You can have massage therapists work on it, all kinds of different ways to help keep you strong. Because if your fascia is not moving well, you're not moving well and you're not at your 100% strength capacity. Now, this is something that a lot of folks in the sports world know about, but don't talk about. Um, it's not; it's almost like not as advertised as it should be, because we talk all about, oh, I want stronger muscles, I want muscles, 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 I want to be stronger, and we think, yes, muscles, but we don't think about the fascial connection with it, because these, this tissue, this wrapping that you have, has a lot of nerves in it, it's, it's covered and loaded with nerves, and it contributes to your ability to be able to move on a daily basis. So that's why you need to know about it and why it's absolutely crucial to your health. So this podcast is inspired a little bit by a PT friend of mine who gave me this fabulous book on fascia. Um, it's called Fascia in Sport and Movement. And it has a lot of different sections written by multiple authors. So I'm not going to bore you with listing out all the authors. But if you want to geek out and know the basis of what inspired this episode, the book is Fascia in Sport and Movement. And there's a gal who is dancing on the front of it. And there are a lot of authors down the right-hand side of it. Um, but it's a great book because it really dives in in, in textbook style as to what fascia is in a much more detail than I could possibly go through um, in this podcast. And it goes into ways that you can keep it moving. And I'm going to absolutely talk about that today for sure. So let's jump into this wrapping component. And one of the things that I see over and over and over again in my practice, because of course, with this podcast, I like to share with you what's, you know, what I see in, in work, because I feel like a lot of people are spouting off on this works, that works, but they don't have a clinical aspect of it. They don't see what happens in a everyday setting. And I'm here to bring that to you because I work with pain all day, every day in my office. In fact, it's kind of my crack. I love working with pain. Um, fascia is such a complete component of 
the overall pain response. So perhaps you have an area that aches you often, or you have an area that just feels tight and restricted. It doesn't move like it should. Most likely there is a fascial connection there, especially when there's been no injury at all. Like you, you didn't, you know, get hit by a truck. You didn't, you know, fall down some stairs. Nothing happened. All of a sudden this area just started hurting. That is mostly a fascial connection. And if you go to an orthopedic doc or you go get evaluated, a lot of times they're going to be like, well, you know, you got arthritis, especially if you're over 40. Um, they're going to be like, yeah, it's probably arthritis. No big deal. Because there's not anything in terms of tests coming back as there being a joint issue or something of that nature. So often it's going to be, well, you have arthritis. Well, that's not good enough. Yeah, we probably all have arthritis because we do move, we walk, we, you know, are active, hopefully. Hopefully I've inspired you to be active with this podcast. But there, that's BS. We can still move with arthritis and it's usually because our tissues are too tightly wound. So how do they get that way? Well, within our fascial tissue, we have a lot of nerves, like I had mentioned. In particular, we have nerves that sense pressure, touch, and our location in space. They're called proprioceptive nerves. And so they're judging, am I, up, am I upside down? Am I standing straight up? Am I leaning to the side? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? It, it judges your, your location in space. And they're constantly on. They're always on to know where you're at because our fascial tissue also has a huge connection to the fight or flight response. So your sympathetic nervous system, because if we sense a bear or we sense threaten something that's threatening us, we need to be able to get blood flow to the fascial tissue in addition to your muscles to get out of whatever danger that is approaching. So society as a whole is pretty much somewhat in a state of fight or flight, no matter what, because of how much noise, per se, we have going on around us. We also have multiple traumas through life. We push ourselves to the limits. We do, 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 go, go, go. And most of us are kind of stuck in a sympathetic nervous state anyway, which is otherwise known as stressed out. And your fascial tissue feels that. That's why when you're in a room that is, you know, there's stressful stuff going on, you start to feel your shoulders creeping up or just let's put it this way. Maybe you just start to feel stress. You can feel your shoulders creeping up as if they're going to turn into your earrings. That's your fascial tissue doing that. It's the sense of the nerves sending a message to the brain and then it goes back down and we get this big so brain message um, going up saying there's danger. Message comes back down from the brain. Tighten up. Prepare for fight. Prepare for battle. So A lot of us are running around prepared for battle with really tight tissue. Now compound that with eating junk, franken food, compound that with being dehydrated because we're drinking too much coffee and not replacing with water or being toxic because we're drinking too much alcohol or continuing to eat too much junk food and not moving like we should. So we have a compounding situation here with making our fossil tissue super sick, basically. All right, so let's go back to that area that you have that's an ache or pain that just bothers you on a regular basis, but you're not really sure why or what happened. And, you know, you're like, yeah, I work out, but I don't know. I didn't t- I didn't lift anything enough to tear. Or I don't know. Um, for most people, let's put it this way, top of the shoulders is very common and behind the knees, a lot of, a lot of restrictions behind the knees on the sides of the knees I see. And these are very, very common areas that we are gauging where we are in space. Now that might sound weird, but the fascial tissue and their proprioceptive nerves have to kind of figure out where we are to be able to keep us upright and moving. Our shoulders are kind of a balance area. Our hips are, our knees are, our ankles. Anywhere there's that joints in the the stacked component of us standing up. So ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, and then of course the whole spine. Those are key factors in our ability to stand upright and walk. And proprioceptive nerves need to gauge that. But 
when the proprioceptive nerves become damaged. And by that I mean not like they're being torn or ripped apart or anything in this case. Yes, that can happen in major injuries. But in the case of a chronic ache or pain that has no reason for being there, it's that those proprioceptive nerves have been entrapped in scar tissue. They've been entrapped in the fossil tissue repairing itself over and over again because likely we had poor posture, we walk incorrectly, we wear flip-flops versus proper shoes, we perhaps are walking on too much on the outside of our feet or too much on the inside of our feet, placing extra stressors on certain areas of the body. Now I'm going to use the knee, for example, because for a lot of us, our muscles become tight either on the outside of our leg or inside of our leg, depending on how we walk. It's more common that the IT band, the iliotibial band, which is a tendon, on the outside of your leg will tighten up, which will get stuck to your fascial tissue that wraps around it, and it pulls on the outside of your knee. Super common issue here. Another very common issue is that we have a tight iliopsoas muscle. This is a muscle that is on the front side of your body. It is a hip flexor. It allows you to march, but it allows you to sit like a champ, and so you use it a lot sitting. Now, this muscle goes from your T12, your thoracic vertebrae, so your spine at the 12th rib area, down to your groin, and it can make the inside of your leg super tight and cause pain on the inside of your knee, in addition to causing pain on your back where you have something called the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. It's kind of this top of the hips kind of pain area. You put your hands on your hip bones and you slide back from there and you feel this little nodule. That's your sacroiliac joint on each side. Oftentimes folks will have pain there if it's actually coming from the muscle in the front pulling. And then that pain goes all the way down to the inside of your knee. Now, when we have tight muscles, that is a message to our body that these muscles are being used more and we must tighten or remodel the attachments to the bone. So the body creates a scar tissue process to make your tendon attachment to your bone stronger. And so if the body's sensing that the outside of your legs are tight, it's going to tighten up the iliotibial band, so the IT band, attachments in your knee, on the side of your knee. And it's also going to, if your hip flexors are tight, because you sit a lot, it's going to tighten your attachments to, so your muscle attachments uh, from the inside of your leg to the inside of your knee. And so when the body's doing that, it's producing scar tissue because anytime we heal or we need to strengthen an area, we create tissue growth. Now the body unfortunately doesn't have a great regulation mechanism in terms of, okay, when do I quit? Because its message is always going to be need to strengthen, need to strengthen, need to repair if our muscles remain tight and don't move properly, if we have lost that fluidity. And so in the, in the muscle, or sorry, in, in the knee, these attachments where you're inside or outside of your muscles are attaching become extremely tight, become really restricted. And all of that new scar tissue that's there to help what your body thinks it needs to help strengthen the connection of those muscles actually drowns out your proprioceptive nerves' ability to sense where it is in space. So the tighter you become, the less fluid you walk, the more pain you're going to have other places, of course, but also the less you're able to sense where you are in space to walk fluidly. So now, once these proprioceptive nerves are drowned out because there's so much scar tissue within them, they can't sense where you are in space. The message to the brain is not as profound about where you are in space, but what ends up happening is your body wants information. Your brain wants information, and it wants it from the sensory organ, your fossil tissue. And so what it does is it turns on the pain nerves. So it upregulates your nociceptors, which are your pain nerves. It upregulates temperature nerves because they flow in the same area as your pain nerves. And so now we're feeling heat and pain more 
than anything. Most commonly, burning pain. So what's happened to a lot of us, and quite possibly in the theory of fibromyalgia even, is that our body has become so riddled with scar tissue that the proprioceptive nerves turn off and now what's left is the upregulation of your pain nerves. And I truly believe that this is a huge issue for a lot of us because if our body is over remodeling or over healing an area that it doesn't really need to heal or remodel, it doesn't need to be creating more scar tissue, we end up with a lot of issues with restriction of motion. We end up with issues of not being able to walk properly. Take, for example, an older individual. I'm going to use my uncle, for example, because I've worked on his knees a lot um, over the years when I go home and visit. He has knees that are huge. And you've probably seen this in older adults too. The knees are like fat. You're like, what the heck? Like they're hard and they're just there. And you're like, what is that? It's all scar tissue. Because we need to be able to move properly with, you know, obviously our knees are a huge component of being standing upright and moving. And we abuse them a little bit, right? Because we we do weird jumping things and and maybe we, you know, do a little bit of too much biking, too much of these things. But you know what? Um, we need to be able to move them as we get older. So I digress. Now, imagine that fat knee that my uncle has and that is literally riddled with scar tissue. Well, he can't, he has chronic pain in that knee. And it's not because he's done anything to it in terms of major injuries. It, it developed over time. And this is slowly happening to all of us right now. Our body is going to take whatever muscles are tight, create scar tissue at the ends of them. So the origin and insertion of those muscles, and it's going to keep laying that down and we'll end up with tighter and tighter muscles and more knots as time goes on and less mobility. And the body's just going to keep in this process unless you do something about it. And so let's go back to my uncle's knee for a moment. What do I do? What do you do about this? How do you prevent your fascial tissue from staying on lockdown? How do you keep this fluidity going? How do you keep your fascial tissue healthy? You got to move it. Keeping moving, mobility. I'm always talking about that as being the key, you know, kind of the fountain of youth to keep you moving. And so with my uncle, we worked on a lot of breakup of his scar tissue. We took erasers. And we, we worked on the, the whole attachment areas and all around his knee. And I'm talking about legit old school erasers, those rectangular erasers that you had in school when I was young. Now, folks who are in their 20s probably haven't seen these things lately. Um, but when I was young, we had these rectangular erasers and we had, you know, pencils in school. Now, the pencils with the five millimeter erasers on the end of them, so those round erasers, those erasers are amazing too for putting them on areas of pain and rocking back and forth. So I have my uncle working with things of that nature, but I also have a lot of patients working with that. Now let's go to what I commonly see in adults right now. Yes, the knees, but hands. Hands are becoming a big issue in young adults. I've got people in my practice in their 20s with locked up hands. That's not normal. Why is this happening? Well, you know, cell phones, tech, techie fingers, typing, all that stuff. And I'm seeing a ton of folks that right around their thumb. So if you're not driving and listening to this, take a look at your palm for a minute. And I want you to press around on the palm, that area that's on the bottom, kind of the lower half, closer to your thumb. And I want you to slide down from your thumb and your thumb's main joint and just get into that meaty tissue and see if you find some knots in there or some areas of tenderness. Most likely you're going to, especially if you're a techie person. And these areas, I'm having folks who work on computers all day, every day, and even those who are just, you know, playing video games are attached to their phones, which is pretty much everybody at least five minutes a day taking a pencil eraser or an old school eraser and just 
pressing in as hard as you can to cause a little bit of pain, but like that, that hurt that feels good and just rock back and forth in that area. Same thing, getting into the palm, going between the fingers, just rock around in there and just work it like, like you're giving yourself a good little massage with an eraser. Sounds super silly, but I have lots of patients that will tell you that this is legit to keep their hands moving well. And what it's doing is it's breaking up that scar tissue and helping with fluidity. When you break up scar tissue, you're bringing blood. I mean, anytime you press on an area, you're bringing blood flow to the area. You're getting sodium, you're getting potassium, you're flushing out inflammatory proteins. You're just helping that area get a good little bath of goodness. It's kind of like a radiator flush to your muscles and tendons in that area. Now, if you have tech hands, you want to also go up to your elbows. And literally, your attachments of all of your muscles that move your fingers and wrist are in your elbow. And they're on either sides of your elbow. And in particular, they attach to your humerus. So that's your arm bone. And if you go above your elbow and just start poking around, you'll find those sore spots. Get those erasers in there. Just work them, work them, work them. This is going to help to go a long way to not have crippled hands going into like your 50s, especially if you're experiencing it now in your 20s. If you're in your 50s, start working on it too. Then that way your hands aren't going to look like grandma's when she was 85. Just imagine grandma's hands. You don't want that. Start working on your hands. Start working on your fingers. Because I use my hands so much in my practice. I do this a lot because it's, it's absolutely important to keep your hands moving too. Because well, grasping things, mobility, but also your independence relies on being able to have good hand dexterity. A lot of people forget about that. We think about walking all the time, which is absolutely crucial and being able to get up from the floor. Absolutely crucial. But hands, big thing too. All right. So let's go back to getting down to the floor and getting back up. I'm shocked by how many people in my practice, in my age group, we're talking late 30s, early 40s, do not effectively lay, like sit down or lay down on the floor and get right back up. That's disturbing. I, I don't even know what to say about that. And it boils down to mobility. It boils down to strength. Not having fascia that, so having fascia that don't, doesn't move well inhibits your overall strength. So those of you who are wanting to maintain their strength with age but don't like to work on Getting massages, don't like to work with releasing tight muscles with lacrosse balls, foam rollers, all those different gadgets. You got to do it because you're, you're only blocking your ability to get optimal strength. Like you're blocking your ability because your fascial tissue is involved in helping you to move like a champ. Okay, so what do we do to move better? What are some of the thoughts on, on fascia and how do we work out, quote, our fascia? Well, one of the coolest ways that has been researched a lot lately to the point where I am totally going to a conference about this in particular is, is that play, childlike play actually helps our fascial tissue. Now you might be thinking, okay, what does that mean? Well, bouncing around, you know how kids kind of just bounce and they're just like happy little, I don't know, happy little critters bouncing around. Um, the movements that kids do actually is amazing for helping to move your fascial tissue because they, they move in different directions. They bounce. Um, and, and we have this idea in, I don't know when this came about, probably sometime in the 90s, early 2000s, that stretches with bouncing is bad. It's going to create a rip of a muscle. And I even had that stuck in my head. I, my dad loves to bounce around when he does his stretches. And I used to yell at him. And now I'm like, hey, dad, you're right. That was hard for me to admit. But he loved that. Um, but bouncing is actually a good thing, according to the research on fascia. So how do you bounce around? All right. So one of the best ways all of us at some capacity live near a school that has a playground. Now I'm not saying go there during school hours. You would be considered a creeper at that point. Unless you have kids, then that's a different story. Me, I don't have kids. I have a dog, a fur baby. And so I'm going to look like a creeper if I go to 
the playground. And I have some podcasts where I've talked about going to the playground and playing, but my husband and I actually do this quite regularly. And, and research, by the way, shows that it's like two to three times a week working on your fascia. So we're just playing on the gym equipment, just kind of bouncing, just channeling your inner kiddo can be quite fun. Um, the balance stuff, there's always in, in, a, in a kid area, especially the one by my house, there's like this wavy balance bar of sorts where you walk on it and work on your balance. And my husband and I were shocked the first times we did it. We, were, we sucked at it. We were like, oh my God, our balance is horrible. But now we're like rock stars with it and then try to like walk towards each other and then turn to try to get around each other on the balance bar just to test our balance. And it's quite fun. So that's one part of it. But there's also the monkey bars. There's also all of the other little play tools, um, crawling through the tunnels, things of that nature, going down slides. These are things that help you to have childlike play, climbing up the chains. Like there's this chain net at the one um, playground that we hit up. And it's absolutely fun because it, it puts you into a crawling position, something that you normally wouldn't do on an everyday basis. So I highly encourage you to hit up playgrounds and play for a little bit. 20 minutes, all you need. And, you know, bring someone with you so you don't feel like a big dork. Um, or if you are on your own and don't have someone to go with you, bring your dog if you have a dog because you can play it off that you're playing with the dog there. Nobody will know. Or just be like me and say, who cares, and just go by yourself anyway. I do it when my husband's not around. So playing in the playground, kind of fun. Acting like you're a ninja, another cool thing. So what does this mean? I don't want you to go and put on ninja clothes, well, unless you want to. But jumping like a cat. So practicing jumping, but very quietly. I have this guy at my gym who does box jumps like a ninja. Like you don't even know he's jumping on the box. And he's he's a bigger guy. I mean, it's incredible. There's me who sounds like a freaking horse and then him ninja next to me. So I was like, okay, I've got to dial this in and play with it. Because there's a ton of different um, thought processes out there in terms of working on fluidity and being quiet while you jump. So I challenge you. Now, in P90X, Tony Horton says something like jumping like a cat with his plyometric workouts. So if you're familiar with that, it's some of the other jumping techniques. But legitimate, like, pretend like you're jumping a river. Okay, maybe not a river. That sounds weird. Pretend like you're jumping a stream. The vision in my head was jumping the Columbia River. That's not going to work. Pretend like you're jumping a little stream or a creek. And see how quiet you can do it. Play with that. Do that for a few minutes a day. See how you feel. Now, another thing that is huge and actually makes me smile is dancing. Now, I'm the world's worst dancer to the point where in Zumba classes, I would hide in the corner and then I just quit because I was like, this is so embarrassing. And I used to teach a, a health kind of class for a Latino group in Colorado um, and I literally had to hire someone to do the Zumba classes because I was trying to dance Zumba style in front of a bunch of Latina ladies that totally have moves. And I'm this white girl that has no moves. Um, so a little background story. I'm better dancing in my shower at home. Let's put it that way. But think about this. If you're a white girl like me that has no moves, that means your fascial tissue doesn't move so well. Those folks that can like move their hips and really groove, they've got great movement of their pelvis. They've got great movement of their shoulder girdle. If you move like a robot when you dance kind of like me, you need to work on that. Because the more fluid you can move, just literally kind of shaking it out, rolling the shoulders, I'm kind of doing it right now, grooving, you can enhance your fascial connections, but also strengthen them. Because what you're doing by enhancing them, you're breaking up scar tissue, you're getting things to move better. And it's all about mobility. Now, when we were in the Cayman Islands, we were watching this gal dancing in her condo doing a workout, which looked much like Zumba. I'm guessing that or one of the Shanti like hip hop ab workouts. I mean, she was killing it. I was so impressed. Like, I, I kind of laughed because I was like, man, I can't do that. But this woman had a great body in terms of 
she moved well just on her own because I knew who she was outside of her condo watching her walk around. And she was very lean. It, it was impressive. But if you think about a dancer and someone who has a lean body but moves well, their fascial tissue is incredibly pliable and movable. No, yes, they may have injuries because they might come down weird or something might happen with the dance. But for all of us who are not professional dancers, there is something to be said about the fluid movements within dance and creativity. Now, most of us, when we dance at home, we're, we're channeling our inner child. We'll bounce around. We'll do whatever types of movements feel good to us. And to be honest with you, this fossil book that I was reading, their, their research is all about creative dance and movement and the effects of that for the body. So I'm telling you to dance. I'm telling you to go out, play with it, get fluid with it, and dance your butt off. Turn some music on and see where it takes you. Maybe you're like more of a contemporary dancer. Maybe you're more of a ballet kind of dancer. Maybe you mix it up and do a little hip hop, Zumba, whatever. Hey, it doesn't matter. Nobody's judging you. But what you're doing in those different movements that you just come up with, moving your arms, twirling your arms around, it's different movements than what you would do on an everyday basis of sitting, walking, or even going to the gym. Because honestly, in the gym, these are usually push-pull types of movements they're not creative movements. Just saying. Yes, I love CrossFit, but it's not fluid movements all the time. It's it's sometimes herky-jerky stuff. Like burpees are not fluid. You could play with them and make them that way. Uh, but point being is with the traditional workout styles or whether you're going to the gym and using gym equipment, it's, it's still a standardized push-pull type of movement. It's not putting your joints in lateral movements and circular movements like they should be doing to help keep them fluid and keep your fascial tissue healthy. So your goal after this podcast is to go dance. Do it in your shower, do it wherever you want to. Go dance 20, 30 minutes or go play on a playground. All right, so that's goal number one. Goal number two for that fascial tissue, it needs to be kept healthy in terms of nutrients. It needs sodium, it needs potassium, it needs electrolytes. And so a lot of us are drinking a ton of water, but we're not replacing with electrolytes, especially if you're someone who is suffering with chronic pain, or you're someone who does work out on a regular basis at a higher intensity. Maybe you're running a lot, maybe you're doing CrossFit, maybe you're lifting a lot of weights. You need to make homemade Gatorade. So eight ounces of water, half of a lime, a quarter of a lemon, whichever one you want to use, squeeze it into the water, like two little granules of salt, about three drops of honey, maple syrup, whatever you want in terms of your sweetener, mix that up, drink it down, homemade Gatorade, at least once a day, or you could buy electrolyte powder if you want to, but that helps with keeping your fascial tissue, like lots of stores of items for your fascial tissue to keep them moving, keep it repaired. Also, the other big thing is eating healthy. Eating is closest to nature. The more franken food you get, the more it's going to get stuck in your peripheral tissues because your body's trying to get rid of it. What does it do? It's either going to create cellulite, so fat stores, and then what? How do you get rid of it? Mm -hmm. It's hard. My next podcast is going to be all about working on the tissue, in particular with cellulite, working on the tissue in terms of heating it up and trying to help release junk from the tissue. So at this point, if you're wanting to work on chronic pain, you're wanting to be fluid, you want to have the most movable body up until 105 years of age, start dancing, start playing on the playground, get that stuff moving. Also get out your eraser, that old school rectangular one that I used to use in school, or get out a pencil eraser and use that pencil eraser on any area that you can get to that hurts and just aches. Just rock it back and forth, give it a little pressure to the point where that hurt feels so good, um, and just go for it. Just rock around in there. And like I said, no more than 20 minutes, but work on it. Now, next podcast, so stay tuned is going to be all about how do we warm up the fascia. Because the fascia likes to be warm. It likes some 
It likes some infrared and red light therapy, and it also needs a little bit of certain types of foods and a little bit of tricks because, especially for ladies, cellulite's a big problem. And cellulites trap toxins in the skin and fascia, and they're waiting to get out. There's ways to move it. There's ways to prevent it. Now, I'm not touting a miracle program here, but what I am touting is a way to get your skin to look a hell of a lot better than it looks right now. And so in my next podcast, I'm going to talk all about other ways that we can keep our fascial tissue healthy so that by the end of it, we've got a whole plan for working on our tissue issues. All right, folks, you have survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm going to have some great resources here soon on YouTube, on my YouTube channel at Dr. J. Kraus, and on my website at drjkrausnd.com. I'd love to hear from you. Shout outs, whatever, just some comments. Let me know what else you want to learn about the fascial tissue and if you try some of my tricks out and how you do. All right, gang, thanks for listening. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Thanks for tuning in to The Health Fix, the podcast all about taking control of your health, rebelling against aging, and having fun every day. A lot of patients ask me, do you think I'm aging too fast? So I created an evaluation checklist for you to see for yourself. Plus, I created a resource guide to help you slow down the aging process right now. You can find it for free on my website, drjkrausnd.com. If you like this podcast, help get the word out to others by liking it and rating it. If you'd like more natural health tips and want to join our Facebook community where I interact daily, click on the Join Group button on our website at drjkrausnd.com.